Are you looking to create timeless beauty in your garden? It's always a great idea to add roses. At Heirloom Roses, they know that the best roses start with the best roots, which is why they only hand propagate own root roses. These own root roses will outlive and outshine grafted roses from the big box stores, resulting in stronger disease resistance and a longer lifespan and stunning blooms that are always true to the variety. Heirloom Roses is located in Oregon, is a family-owned business that grows over 900 varieties of roses for gardening zones 3 through 10. Use their great search tool to narrow down your choice based on zone, fragrance, growth habit, color, and more. Plus, they have a one-year guarantee, so if your rose doesn't thrive in its first year, they will replace it for free. Heirloom Roses is also committed to producing only disease-free plants and genetically test all of their roses to ensure the cleanest plant material possible. You can have peace of mind knowing your newest rose will be healthy and ready to thrive and blossom for years to come. As a special offer for our listeners, Heirloom Roses is offering a 20% discount off all roses using Backyard20 code at checkout now through September 30th, 2023. And since they ship all year round, you can choose the perfect ship date for your garden. It's time to experience growing roses the way nature intended on their own roots. Visit them at heirloomroses.com to find your next rose today and take 20% off with Backyard 20. To have a good harvest, one must plant good seeds and must also use the right kind of fertilizer. The carrots have grown large and firm. How good they will taste. All right, everybody. Today is the day. My goal, excuse me, our goal is to help your backs with this one, all right? We're all getting older. <laughs> Gravity is a real charm of a friend. And um, when we design our gardens, I think that we should really look into our aging bodies and stuff to help us, don't you? Well, that felt dark, but yeah. It did, but it's true, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, gardening is a very labor intensive as far as like backs and knees and stuff like that i would say take care of your parts while gardening <laughs> what parts is that never mind all of your parts yeah. man don't wear anything too tight don't wear anything to- <laughs> so, <laughs> unless it's a brace of sorts so yeah. i will say this i do get tired of um in the spring because everything's so low to the ground, I feel like I'm just like mm-hmm. always down on the ground. Like I always look forward mm-hmm. to summer so I can stand up and pick, and it's just not that yeah. stressful on me. So, um, but yeah, we're gonna talk about designing the garden that way because I did a little bit of this this year with an, more intention, and I was really happy with what little bit worked for me. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. No, man, I'm about it. I um, every time I think about all oh, the aches that are associated with the earlier part of the season for me. Um, you know, I say to myself, oh, girl, you need to get in shape, just generally speaking. And that's true. <laughs> Two things can be true at the same time. But there is a lot of hauling. There's a lot of up and down. There's a lot of crouching, depending on how your garden's planted. Um, and I, I definitely think there are ways to design your space that could minimize some of that. I, I don't know that you're going to eliminate it. Um, but, but definitely coming out of the season with, um, maybe healthier parts. I'm just going to keep on saying parts. Parts. Hey, you know what? That works for Mm me. Yeah. And I mean, I've done, like, I have a bad back in particular from a rough life and, uh, I've, I've had major injuries and still had to work in the garden and have figured out because, you know, once you hurt yourself. That's all she wrote, man. You can feel every single time you use that muscle. And so Mm -hmm. I figured it out, like started figuring out like how I can do certain things and all that. But we're not going to talk about it. If you should bend over, use your knees, like, come on, people, we all know, you know (laughs) what I mean? We've, we've all been there and done that. But as far as like planting design and stuff like that and gardens, I think it's a really good conversation to have. So I think what we should do. I think, I think, I think what we should do is really start with a like construction of a garden. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does that sound to you? 
That sounds good. I mean, are you talking about the actual like rows and or beds and or containers? Yeah. Like how those are Just put together? Just rough. Yep. I mean, you know, I know that a lot of people already have their stuff figured out, but I'm trying to get to my notes here. I mean, I think that um, this is maybe music to some folks' ears if they are just starting out. Yeah. If they are expanding, right? There are things that I've been able to do with some spaces that I've been growing in kind of as it was, and I've modified a couple of things. Um, so I wouldn't say I've overhauled, in that case, a design, um, but I've tweaked some things that just are more pleasant for me, I think. So I'm, I'm ready with yeah, you Yeah, I mean... the. You know, when you're laying out your garden or whatever, you know, pathways and stuff like that are really important. And I can speak to this because one of my gardens, I have two foot pathways. It's about the size of a wheelbarrow. If I had a push lawnmower, which mine broke and I got rid of it, but you could push it through, you know, plenty of space. Now, my other one has like six inches and it's kind of a pain, but that's in a wild garden. I didn't really have a whole lot of choice. So, you know, there is that, but it makes it a lot harder for me to get in there and maneuver. And so I have to plant stuff that don't need a lot of attention in one particular bed. Oh, smart. Mm -hmm. You know, because I can't get to the front side of That's why, like in my videos, you know, I always go to the back side of that tomato bed. Mm -hmm. That's why. Mm -hmm. Because the front side, I mean, it's like walking a tightrope. You know, so just something as easy as that can make all the difference. And I didn't think it would until I've had this situation arise. Yeah, there um, there's small things like I didn't do this on purpose, but after I did it, I realized, oh, this works. So what is it? Is it a four by four, the big block of wood? That's a four by four. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah, four by four. So um, one of the first Let's see, it's not the first I've been. One of the beds in the backyard garden, I basically built like 20 inches tall. There was two planks that went up. And gosh, do I wish I would have left that bed as is. <laughs> uh, so to connect those pieces of wood on each corner, I have like a four by four inch post. Right. And so um, it is the perfect thing. These are small things, but these matter. The perfect thing to put a pair of um, garden shears on because it's a flat, you know, surface yep. that four by four. I mean, that's the space you have. Coffee cups. Yep. You know, um, and I ended up breaking down that bed where it's only half of the height. But I took that design forward. So technically, and I've seen your beds and a lot of people build them. If I would have used a different type of wood, especially, I wouldn't have needed that anchor piece of wood that was that tall or that wide even. But because it was basically about four, I'd say about mm, about two feet tall, probably. Um, it's perfect height for me just to put my cup down. I don't need to bend. I don't need to do anything. Yeah. Right. And so my beds... Um, I think I have three beds that are like that, two or three beds that are like that. And again, when you're moving about, especially for me, because I'm in a tight space, generally speaking, the way I've designed it, you want those little like surprises, those pleasantries in gardening. I have one more note, but I'm going to throw it back to you. And it's around um, water hoses. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I was going to say, you know, for me, I don't drink coffee, but... Generally, you know, I have a bottle of water, water. with me or I have like um, a usually in the winter time, I'll take like a travel mug of tea or something. Mm-hmm. And you're exactly right. Like having somewhere to set that is mm-hmm. huge. So this is like in the construction of the bed itself. And I, I was we went quick, quick story. We went backpacking one time, um, one of our trips, and we came to a campsite. And when we got there, you know, when you go out there, there's nothing, you know, we were I think we were about 80 miles into the woods Mm -hmm. by the time this day had come. And there was a nail in a tree, one nail in a tree where you could hang something up. And I just remember sitting and thinking like, thank God that this one simple nail is in this tree because it allows me to do this. And it's the same thing with the garden. Like we don't really need to have like a table to take around with us or anything crazy, but something that simple makes that much of a difference where you're not laying your tools in the dirt and stuff like that. Like I use the edge of my bed for the same thing. I typically use the corners so I can straddle the corners and it's the same Mm -hmm. idea. So there's um, a gardener that I followed. um, Thank you for following me. 
Hmm? Thank you for following me. Of course. <laughs> and uh, I didn't say Ben Gardner. I said a Gardner. <laughs> oh. um, and he builds, and this is not, you know, I mean, I'm sure he didn't, this isn't his original idea, but um, like ledges on his yeah. bed, it's a raised bed. So the cage baby, the way that it's constructed is, I don't know, I'm terrible at this, it's probably about six inches wide or something. It's enough for me to put a butt cheek on yeah. it. You know, like, you know, and that's huge. Big difference. When I look at the, the cage baby, um, especially because that structure only allows me to get in one side. Yeah. So I am reaching, I am stretching, you know, and to, obviously I have to bend down and kind of sitting down, I'm in a seated position and the beds are low, but I don't have to kneel. I don't have to crotch. I can actually sit down and lean inside and work. Um, And small things like that, obviously, again, I could put a cup there. I can put tools there. It's really, I think, um, it makes that experience much more comfortable. And if I had to count, it'd be dozens and dozens of times throughout the season that I'm sitting in one of those, on top of one of those ledges. Um, That was intentional, again. That was by design. Yeah, I've thought about putting those on my garden, and it it would be a simple task, but I don't want to eat up the space. Mm -hmm, So that's mm -hmm, kind of where mm -hmm. I stand with that. But I, I can definitely see that. And I mean... All of this goes into like the actual construction of a bed where you're talking about in-ground beds, raised beds, or containers. I mean, Mm -hmm. these are like the three categories, right? And I mean, they all have their ups and downs. Um, You know, the typical thought process, at least for me, is like we want to try not to walk on our planting soil. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you can cause compaction and stuff like that. Now, an in-ground bed is totally different. You're going to have to walk in there, but usually you're going to create paths or something like that. But in a raised bed, when you don't want to walk in, and this is really geared towards raised beds, we need to decide how to design this space. And when I say design it, like the actual construction, I would just say don't make it too wide. Yep. I mean, plain and simple, you know, um, I know a lot of people that do two foot wide beds. I personally run four foot wide beds and I find those a little bit too wide, but I'm a taller individual, so I can reach in the middle, but it is more difficult at times. Yeah. I, um, my beds are under four feet when you start talking about the way the cuts, it's probably like, um, I had to do the the inches in my head for 40, for four feet. So it's probably like 42 inches instead of 48 inches. Yeah. And, you know, again, that wasn't by design. That's just basically, you know, the way that I ended up getting the wood cut. Um, and I have to walk on either side to get to it. It's really hard for the cage, maybe, but I can get to the middle, generally speaking. If I had to do it all over again, I'd probably go with three feet wide bed. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. And this is putting aside, like I'm, I'm losing a whole, you know, eight inches compared to where it was six inches compared to where I am now. Um, and the length of that bed, but it would be more convenient. This new bed that I'm coming, um, that I'm going to be putting together later this summer is going to be, um, it's kind of one of those like, you know, plug and play kind of constructions. I'm going to go with the, the design that's two feet long, excuse me, two feet wide. And in part, it's because that's the space I can fit it in. But I also look forward to like, I can absolutely get to the, the either side of the bed standing on like, you know, the side of the yeah. bed. I don't have to walk around, you know, to work the other side. Yeah. I mean, that makes a big difference. So mm-hmm. just thinking about that in itself. And then as far as like, if you go into containers, I mean, you know, depending if you put them on the ground down low or if you stack them high or you're doing vertical mm-hmm. gardening or anything like upside down gardening for that matter, you know, anything like that. Just want to be aware of what we're doing and how we're using it to our advantage. So um, these things make a big difference because, I mean, if you plant because we're going to get into planting now, if you plant spinach in the middle of a four foot bed you've got to reach into that bed to harvest multiple plants. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. the reason why we're talking about this is because we're kind of gearing up for fall at this point. I mean, I know it seems early, but like a lot of our listeners, we've done polls and stuff like that. A lot of you guys are actually growing three to four seasons a year. And so if you're only doing three, it's spring, summer, and fall. So reaching in 
to do these little harvests for these smaller plants isn't really good, right? So I do stuff where I'll put like my cabbage in the middle of the bed where I only have to harvest it one time. Mm. So when I go in there and reach for it, that's it. You know what I mean? And then it's gone. So, you know, using that to your advantage really helps. Before we, before I dive into planter planting, I do want to make one quick note. I was trying to figure out the actual name of them. So, you know, those black narrow window box, um, like people put flowers in them oftentimes. Mm-hmm. There's one that's like this narrow, but then there's one that comes a little bit larger. Um, the one that's a little bit larger, I put, um, beans in, pull, um, bush beans this year. But anywho, the planter stand. And people use these in their house, too. So there's the one level. um, I actually have one behind this computer. There's the one level at the bottom that sits all the way down to the floor. And then there's the one level up top. So I got a bunch of those for various reasons. And one of them is empty. And so I had it outside and it occurred to me, you know what? I can actually put this in a corner. I can get my water pitcher and put it at the top level. Again, there's nothing in that in that stand, put it at the top level. And I could easily put my hose, especially when I'm fertilizing, like with a liquid fertilizer, I don't have to bend over to basically get my watering can filled. Like that's a whole pain in the Mm -hmm. butt, right? So this is using something you already have in place. I wouldn't buy it for this purpose, but using something you've already purchased and it's made fertilizing that much easier to be quite frank. I'm lifting the pitcher when it's empty from the ground. So it's not heavy. I'm putting it on this stand, filling the water, adding my fertilizer. And then I can, again, in the standing position, walk around the garden when I need to come back to refill it. Same thing. Um, So again, those are small kind of tips and tricks that I don't, I mean, I don't know. There's a website I I found it on. It kind of just came to me as I was in the garden. So, all right, back to planting. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just thinking about how things grow, you Mm know, um, I did. So what I did this spring is I took the front edge of my one of my beds and I put all of my spinach on the front edge. So when I wanted to harvest it, I could sit down on the ground and, you know, my arm length is pretty far stretched. So I can kind of get a big swath of it all at once. Mm -hmm. So um, like this year. So I know I've been talking a lot about like monocropping and stuff is I'm really liking it. But in the fall. If my beds are four by eight feet, I don't want to plant my spinach in the middle of that four by eight foot bed. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. I'm going to use that like this to my advantage to where I can do that, plant everything on the edges that can be harvested a lot or a lot of little tiny things. You know, like I would like if you go to summertime, like I wouldn't put bush beans in the middle of a bed. You know what I mean? I would put those on the edges. Yeah. So, you know, you can insert any vegetable that you want into that conversation. I think, um, you know, with height and then frequency to harvest or maintain are the considerations when it comes to where you're planting. You know, so bush beans is a really good example. You should be harvesting those once they start producing pretty often. Yeah. Do you want to kind of try to navigate through things to get to them no no right especially if you have to bend down to get to them you're bending down and now stretching through like that's not convenient um that actually is a a good reason to consider pole beans again they they produce at different levels yeah you know um and take a different amount of time to produce um but generally speaking if you're growing pole beans vertically there's not a ton of of bending after you plant Mm -mm. them Right. You know, no. And I mean, especially when you have a raised bed, because you already have it elevated to an extent to start off with, Mm -hmm. you know, based on if you're 10, 20, whatever, how many inches up you are. So you kind of have that platform to work with. So, I mean, it it works out pretty well. But, um, you know, I did this over the year and like carrots is another thing. So Mm. um, you do harvest a lot of carrots, but you only harvest them like once. Right. So I typically put them on the edge of the bed, but I'm I'm starting to think like, why don't I just put them in the middle, you know? And mm-hmm. it'll, it'll suck that one time I have to harvest them, but at least after that, I'll be done with it. Now, let me challenge you there, because once you put it in the middle and then harvest them, won't it become more difficult to replant in that space? Well, <clears throat> it's interesting you say that, because that mm-hmm. brings us to kind of 
and these two kind of mold together, but if you group your plantings by harvest times, then it's not an issue. All right. All right. Somebody that's coming on. Coming Come on. on. <laughs> Come on, somebody. So, I mean, you know, it's like, yeah. So one of my beds, I have carrots and parsnips. So, you know, I've, I've grouped them together that way so that we can harvest them all at the same time. So the goal for me is to really get that bed emptied around the same time. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. typically we typically don't harvest something and like I harvest them, my carrots today and then this afternoon turn around and plant something in right behind it. Usually don't sure, do that. Sure. There are times, mm-hmm. but usually you don't do that. So. I don't think if you start planning and thinking things out more thoroughly, I think that it, it doesn't have to be that way, you know? Yeah, no, I, I think that's um, spot on. I've I've actually been I've really liked for carrots as an example to tuck them in and plant them on the edge of the bed, not necessarily for the purpose of what we're talking about. But they kind of, again, I'm tucking them in. It's filling in a gap, so to speak. And when I harvest them, it's not going to be that big of a hole. There's not a lot that I'm going to, I mean, I could probably follow up with some radishes. You know, um, a good example of um, of that same kind of scenario, like I have a four by four foot bed of garlic. Now, fortunately, I'm going to be harvesting all of that garlic generally at the same time yeah. right you know so now that entire bed is is ready for you know what's next um behind that bed is a potato bed you know and so i have sunflowers in the middle that volunteer that i didn't have the heart to pull and obviously the sunflowers generally are going to take me through the entire season but the potatoes are all around it you know so um i like the idea of if you're going to go in once it's okay if it's a little bit um, inconvenient. It's not the most convenient thing in your garden. Yeah. Um, like planting some of those crops in the center. Parsnips is a really, really good one too, since it's so long of a growing yeah. season. Um, something like strawberries, I wouldn't want to put in the middle of a bed. No, because you're harvesting you know? them all the time. You know, it, you hope you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we're getting our <laughs> supposed pint per plant. <laughs> Which, by the way, my friends uh, down the road, they got some strawberry plants somebody dug up and was given away. So they, um, my buddy's a woodworker. And so he made a planter for them. And you know how you can get the pots with all the holes in them and stuff? We well, made one out of wood. Mm-hmm. And they're oh, cool. starting to get some strawberries. And he's like, they're like, how many should I get? And I was like, well, let me ask you, how many have you got? And they're like, about three or four. I'm like, well, technically you're supposed to get, from what I understand, about 20. And they're like, yeah, that ain't going to happen. I'm like, see? Yeah. yeah. So. But I mean, for me, like this year, I did my onion and garlic bed and that worked out for me. Well, I I planned it wrong. So if I would have flopped the way I planned it, planted it, it would have gone better. But for the conver- for the sake of this conversation, I was able to pull my onions up and then like a week later I came and pulled my garlic up and then that bed was mm-hmm. empty. I let it mm-hmm, sit for mm-hmm. two weeks, came back. And then replanted it with my tomatoes. And that's how I can kind of manage, you know, it's like, <clears throat> and that's where the monocropping really helps out if you're doing that, because, you know, you can just have a bed empty and it doesn't matter. But if we're not mm-hmm. doing that and we're going to assume that we're not, then these are, you know, different. Like that was a two crop um, bed. My other one in the spring, I had lettuce on the back side, cabbage in the middle, and then spinach in the front. And that worked out really good, you know, especially for me because of the lettuce, because I'm not doing cut and come again anymore. I'm just cut harvesting mm-hmm. the whole head. So I was able to come in, harvest the head, and then just start on the outside and work my way in constantly. And then by the time it was done, I had the whole row empty. And then the only thing that was left in the bed at the end was the cabbages. And which, by mm-hmm. the way, two of them were not door That is cabbages. something to note when it comes to the method you're using, just harvesting the head. Again, depending on how you planted it, you may have to bend down, but you're going to harvest that entire head and you're not kind of going plant to plant. You're going to get in and get out. Yeah. You know, generally speaking, you may only want to harvest one, maybe two heads at a time. Um, the, um, the bit about the bed is now empty. You know, based on your planting that also, you know, now you're minimizing how much you're kind of digging in that bed. Right. You know, so there is I've not been able to work up a bed upright. 
you know, like, yeah. like I, I got I got to kick a little bit lower when I'm uh, working up that bed. And so instead of having to like plot in, you know, pop in a couple of plants here and there. And every time I'm doing that, I'm kind of, you know, or I'm sitting on my milk crate getting that done um, using what you did with the onion bed. Like you're going to do it twice this season. Yeah. You know, when you first planted it, you know then you're going to work that bed up again after you harvest and getting ready for your next planting. I mean, this is again, talking about like playing the long game here. All of these little bits are wear and tear. I was actually joking with you earlier this week, but serious. I'm like officially in garden shape. Yeah. I'm officially not, not achy. You know, um, I'm officially, you know, I can, I can go a little bit longer without like the, okay, good, good grief. You know, um, and you used to do, you know, road sports as well. You know how this like, oh, don't don't forget about your rest day. Yeah. I really had rest days built in in the first part of the season. Yeah. You know? like, like, I don't work like, on my garden on oh, Sundays at all. I don't even look yeah, at my yeah, garden yeah. on Sunday. Like that's my day to do. That's actually and that's that's not a bad practice either. You know, having a full on day. But I'm talking about like I was in the garden Monday and it's like, all right, Tuesday, I'm going to lay low. Yeah. You know, that's where I was at the beginning of the season. And now again, I've gotten acclimated to the work that I've been doing. And I'm also, again, just generally based on where we are in the season, there's less of the bending, crotching and, and all of that stuff. Although harvests are coming up. So, you know, that's a whole different story. Yeah. Now let's say that you've, you, you, you know, you've only got one bed. You've got a four by mm-hmm. eight bed. And all right, everybody. So I'm going to go a little bit on the deep end just to kind of make a point here. We're going to talk about plants that don't typically grow in the same season. But let's say you're growing spinach and bush green beans, right? And we typically harvest our spinach more often than our bush green beans. So think about the height of the plant okay because we're already bending over to reach and stretch but we don't want to bend over up and then down to get to the plant too so think about the heights of the final plant like these are all things that are really important right um like the dwarf tomatoes i'm doing this year which by the way i don't know so um there's a whole thing coming out (laughs) You too about those tomatoes, um, but you know they're they're there, and it's this this whole thought process of like as we do these things, it makes it more complicated, and what it ends up doing is it leads to that age old gardener problem where I grow it but I don't harvest it, you know, mm-hmm. my back sore today or I'm tired or it's just you know it's hot outside you don't feel like doing it. And yeah, you're causing friction for yourself. And so we don't want to have to do that. I have this little row of mostly grow bags. It's between the cage baby and that next set of beds. And I found these little crates. They're shorter than a milk crate um, and a little bit more narrow. Um, But they're perfect for me to sit my containers on. Mm -hmm. And so basically I have a row of those. And generally speaking, a lot of people that have containers like to sit them on something, you know, to allow that drainage to come down, you know, so you're not just kind of sitting in that water once it drains and, and so on and so forth. So I use pavers, you know, in some cases, but I don't use what I realized. Hmm. I don't do that. Okay. I said some. Yeah. Um, so what I realized is um, I have two tomato plants in 20 gallon grow bags. So think about, I think it's something like 16 inches tall or something. Who knows? I'm probably making this all up. If you're that interested, you can Google how tall um, 20 gallon grow bags are. Um, But don't tell me if I'm wrong because I'm comfortable with where I am right now. (laughs) Anywho, between the, between the little crate thing and the the height of the, um, the bags, I realized yesterday that there is absolutely, I can actually stand straight up and I'll be able to harvest all the tomatoes where the lower row, um, uh, raised beds that my tomatoes are growing in. I kind of got to get down low because we know the tomatoes are also going to put their fruit on at the bottom first, yeah. you know? And so I, I kind of stumbled into that and I'm like, Oh, that's pretty convenient, you know? And then one of them is a cherry tomato that's sitting in the grow bag. And I'm like, well, you know, you're picking those things like all the time once they start coming on. Um, so again, just one more way of maybe not intentionally, but I decided to plant those tomatoes in that space and it's going to work out for me. 
Yeah. So, uh, since you bring up grow bags, I know you've been doing them for a couple of years. How, how do you feel about them? I'll still plant in them until some, I wake up one morning. Look, I wake up one morning and they're, they're mysteriously gone. I I think they're great for peppers. I th- Heart stop. That was in, in sentence, I said, period. I th- I th- look, everybody, I said, what do you think about grow bags? And Batavia stuck her lips out and rolled her eyes back and wiped her forehead and the hand went up and I knew it wasn't going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> it, you, you're getting all of this because of the angle I'm sitting at too, yeah. you know. Um, oh, you made me so, snort. That's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I've grown um, potatoes, tomatoes. Uh, I generally have struggled with growing tomatoes in containers. So just know that. Uh, peppers. I planted sweet potato slip in one this year. I've, I'm doing okra in a grow bag this year. Um I have tried things like brassicas. um, And right now I can say if I only had, you know, one container to grow peppers in and I paid for them, it would be grow bags. My buckets do really, really well with peppers, too. Yeah. Um, I think that as the plant kind of starts to grow any of those other plants, they do well until they don't. So... I, I wouldn't recommend grow bags, yeah. but I wouldn't throw them out if you have them. Um, I am not convinced that, you know, so part of the whole selling on it is the way that, you know, the aeration works and the way that, you know, the entire container basically has, um, you know, drainage holes, right? You just based on the, the, the material. There's the issue. I think they may get dry. I think they may dry out um, quicker than plastic. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that being an issue. I was just mm-hmm. wondering if you've changed because I know you, last year we had talked about it, so I figured it was a good opportunity. Um, they're they're cheap though. Yeah, that's the I I wouldn't describe myself as team grow bag, but yeah, the entry fee. I think I checked again; it's like twenty two dollars for five bags of most any size. You you basically have to buy five twenty gallons or five ten gallons and so on. It'd be great if they and maybe someone there are a couple of different companies that do it. It'd be great if you can pick and choose a size, or at least they have a pack of five with multiple sizes. But it's cheaper than any other container beyond the free containers. Uh, so you know what. Here we go. If you're um, an engineer of any kind, do me a favor. Make a grow bag that is impervious on the outside, which means it does not suck in air from the outside and only on the bottom. And you've got, I think you got a winner. Mm. Because I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, like I've grown in five gallon buckets before and they work great. They're ugly as hell. Mm -hmm. They're just Mm -hmm. ugly. I always tuck them over on my fence yeah. because of that purpose. Yeah. Like they're kind of, and they're lined up. So it creates some kind of symmetry, but yeah, it ain't, it ain't the best. No, look. but the grow bags, they, they do help with that. But that whole aeration thing, I'm just mm-hmm. over engineering something personally. But anyways, we'll move on from that. Yeah. There's it's supposed it. And maybe again, maybe there is true science behind this. The, um, the roots don't get wound up like you can see them getting wound up like in a five gallon bucket or something. Yeah. I don't know. I've never had roots being all wound up when I empty those grow bags. No. Nah. Wind up. Just give me my fruit. <laughs> Just wind up. But um, <laughs> no. And, you know, one like I've done on my beds, too, I've got um, and my containers as well. I've got watermelons on the edge of the bed. So mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. it it's a good bad scenario the good is it doesn't take up any room inside of my bed none whatsoever just for that plant the bad news is because it trails out over and goes Mm -hmm. out but then the bad news is because it goes out there's portions of my yard in which i cannot really get in to cut the grass for fear Mm -hmm. of hurting it so you could have weed problems set in and stuff like that but at the same time i do this with sweet potatoes as well 40 to 50 pounds of sweet potatoes and a little bit of extra grass. I mean, come on. You know what I'm saying? I got to get my priorities straight. So, yeah, (laughs) it works for me. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the idea, because you're not for those aren't growing them vertically. But I think that, you know, this you're saving space. Um, there is some like tussling once because you're growing them in the traditional way once you need to harvest those things. But generally, they're low maintenance crop, yeah. you know, 
the next time you're going to work with them, you may be kicking some vines around, but the next time you're going to work with them is to harvest. Yeah, them, exactly. You know, uh, harvest the melon. So, yeah. And I mean, you know, once you start working in all of these different aspects, just making like, I mean, I'm sure most people have a garden plan. I'm sure you guys <laughs> already have a fully planted garden at this point. But moving forward, you can start to kind of think about these different options that you have available to you. Because, I mean, when it comes down to it, there's, I mean, it's not only the planting, the the actual plant in the ground, but it's also the planting part. Mm. And I mean, I'm referring to like tools and equipment and stuff like that. So that can make a big difference as well in all of this. Um, one thing that I've done is I have hung up my spade. I no longer am using spade. What? Okay. Why is that? I mean, why aren't you using a spade? Here we go. Well, it's just because I've, you know, I'm using a shovel. I'm using hose and stuff oh. like that in order to dig into the ground because I can stand up and do it. And I've actually oh, found that okay. the symmetry of what I've been planting is working a lot better that way as well. So that kind of has been working out for me in a positive direction. So I apologize for being dismissive in that moment. Yeah, that's okay. Um, based on the topic we're talking about. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're all always coming up with the, I'm, I'm swearing this thing off. Now, you see that? That's just backhanded. We did this yeah. you were yesterday. <laughs> we were talking about something. Oh, this, he did a great video. You have to tell us the name of the video. And I was just really, really pleased with how he covered the content. Um, and, and, you know, it's like, 14, 15 minutes, and I normally multitask when I'm watching, you know, garden videos. If it's just all picturesque, I'll, you know, save those for when I can sit down at, you know, a computer or look at my phone. Um, but I was glued to the screen and I was intently listening and I was working my way up to a compliment, which is coming across much better today than it did yesterday. <laughs> I don't know. I was like three minutes in and he's like, I set it up to say this is a compliment. He's like, I'm still. Uh, is I'm waiting. Are we get to the yeah, compliment. I was like, are we going to get like, to the compliment? I mean, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but look, I lost my train of thought. But for the uh, the planting, when I was thinking about this yesterday, um, I I don't know what in the world I was thinking about. So I, before we move on, I want to talk about one more planting thing and timing thing. This first uh, bed in the front yard, or second bed in the front yard, where I have my cabbage still growing. Yeah. Um, I move the cabbage once I planted it, then moved it because I wanted to put it on the far end of the bed. Cause I knew I would harvest my broccoli first. I don't know. Maybe that I thought the broccoli was already growing and established or growing too, too long, but I put the cabbage from the place I could actually comfortably reach into the bed. I put the cabbage first and then behind the cabbage, I put the broccoli. I know again that I'm going to pull out the broccoli first. So not only was I squeezing in to get to the broccoli to harvest the heads and the side shoots, um, I now basically have these two plants sitting behind my cabbage. doesn't make any sense whatsoever, other than it'll be really convenient to harvest the cabbage because it's sitting in front. So I just want to, again, give one more example of, you know, when you're talking about harvest time and that impacts placement. Um, it was uncomfortable. I was twisting. I was like, you know, on a tightrope trying to get to the bed when I was harvesting yeah. the cabbage and I can't, excuse me, harvesting the broccoli. And I was harvesting that plant more than once because again, I had the heads and I had to come back in for the side shoots. Yeah. You know, I actually have probably a third time I'll come back in for a set of side shoots for these last couple of plants. Well, and that's important. And it's absolutely inconvenient. Yeah. That's important too. I mean, the harvest time on stuff shouldn't be overlooked either. Um, you know, we, we talked about the frequency, but you know, if you've got, for me, like I, I tend to have been planting my beds lately based on bolt time, you know, uh -huh, so, interesting. so when uh -huh. something, you know, I know in the spring that things are going to bolt at a certain pace. And so I know that like, okay, I can go in, I can get the bolting under control. I can get the stuff out. This is going to go first, put it right on the outside, get it out, whatever. Um, you know, and a lot of these like cut and come again stuff will do, but stuff that will be bolted or harvested at certain times, you can kind of time it out too. Mm -hmm. So if you have to do something that's higher in the front, but it's going to go away first before you get to the other thing that's lower, that's okay. Right. As long as it's not blocking the sun 
yeah. for the other part too. That's another aspect, which is kind of, it's kind of a difficult one. You know, like my corn this year is suffering because of that, because I had to put it in this one bed or else it would shade out the other beds, you know, as a big issue. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, sacrifice the thing that you wanted to squeeze in, um, Sometimes it just needs to be sacrificed. I have, it's just one lettuce plant. I mean, how much is a lettuce seed, right? One lettuce plant that I tucked in the far corner. Again, this is only four feet across the far corner of the cage, baby. Uh, And I had collards next to it because that's how I roll. If there's a space, I'm going to put collards in it. But anyway, I had the transplant for the the, uh, lettuce. And I'm just like, I got a bunch of them. I'm going to plug it in. And not only did I forget about it. When I did remember, it was super hard getting back there to get it, you know, so I knew for sure I'd be harvesting the lettuce because it was on its road to Bolt City. Why in the world would I have put it all the way back in that corner? Yeah. Like it didn't make sense, you know, um, I, you know, actually, now that I think about it, I did some cut and come again with that. I think it's probably completely bolted and probably about to go to seed back there because not only is it behind the 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 collar it's it's also undercover well and see that's the thing too is once you get into these bolting ones if you put it in a spot where you can't get it it's just gonna it's gonna bolt and it's gonna Mm -hmm. take up a lot of room and because we can't get to it we tend to leave things long i know i do i'll leave it and be like i'll get to it i'll get to it i'll get to it i mean in my greenhouse i still have a lettuce plant (laughs) it's bolted it's already dropped seeds all over the greenhouse Mm -hmm. i'm probably gonna have Mm -hmm. volunteers everywhere but because (laughs) I planted it in the back corner and then I put my zucchini in the way and the zucchini is now filling up the whole greenhouse. I can't actually get to it in order to pull it out without yeah. messing something up. So it's like, you know, you're just kind of wasting the space at that point. Yeah. Back to that broccoli and cabbage situation. I'm not even, whenever I get to cutting out the broccoli, like the last bit of the shoots, I'm going to wait until I harvest the cabbage until I can clear that little space. Cause it's just inconvenient. It's not, there's not enough return on the investment of navigating, trying to get to it. Whereas if I had flipped the two, you know, potentially I could have planted in front of the cabbage while the cabbage was still growing. But that also introduces the, now you have young things in front of that cabbage and you're ready to come in and ha- harvest that cabbage. Yeah. So in hindsight, now that I'm saying it out loud, even if I would have reversed it, I probably would have still waited until that entire space was clear. So I don't lose on that, but I do inconvenience myself greatly to get at the broccoli multiple times. Yeah. Now, if I had a pair of long handled shears that I could reach over behind and clip and you would too, probably you would just clip that and be done with it, you know? Yep. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I would have left the roots in place, which I almost never do just, you know, again, grab them and keep on moving. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, because, I was doing a lot of burying of the uh, drip system this year. So that's where I, I started using the hoe more often. Mm-hmm. And um, it made a huge difference. Yes, ma'am. I got distracted. Uh, and I wanted to comment on that. Um, so I use a shovel as well as a, um, a spade in my garden. I will, especially with a container, actually with even with raised beds, I will turn soil over using a spade because it's less work on my back. If I'm sitting comfortably on that ledge, you know, on the raised bed, if I can pull a milk crate up, if I can pull like one of the chairs that I have back there, which is very um, comfortable if I'm using a container, it's more, you know, digs and I'm there longer, but it's not as much work on my back and my arms even as it would be if I'm using a shovel. Now you're going to see me with a shovel in my garden, but I'm, I'm pretty particular. It's about four shovels in. I'm just like, Oh, my back and my neck, really? my neck and my back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. This is again, think about this is the beginning of the season too. Yeah. Well, since I'm I broke, near garden shape. since I have a broken bone in my foot, I can't really use a shovel this year, which has worked out in my mm-hmm. favor. Cause I'm like, baby, I can't use my shovel. Can you come out and dig for me? And she's like, fine. <laughs> I'm getting spoiled this year. I'm milking it for everything I can. But, um, you know, and tools doesn't have to be like long hand. And basically for tools, it's like long handled stuff, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you brought up chairs and stools and milk crates and all this stuff. And all that makes a difference. My big thing about it 
you know, if you go circle back to the very beginning is like that ledge or like sitting on the edge of the bed works better for me because I get tired of like carrying like, uh, like I sit on a milk crate and then I move the milk crate or something. I just, yeah, yep, I get yep, tired yep. of that. Yep. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. So I'm kicking the milk crate around. I mean, I have one for the front yard first off. And one for the backyard. Like, first you got to do that. You can't be, you know. So, based on your regard, you should have one on one end and one on another. But, no, I get something that's built in versus something that, you know, you're going to be moving around. The amount of times I've walked around saying, oh, the milk crate is over there. So, there is that bit. Um, Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we, depending on where we are with the garden in that particular time, we make adjustments you know, to what we use and how we use it. But I think you first want to start with what's already fixed in your garden and making sure that it's convenient for you to navigate physically. Yeah. Right. Like my mom, she's got terrible back problems. Um, she's ha- basically handicapped. Um, and so I got her a couple years ago, one of those stools that holds all the garden tools and stuff in it. Mm-hmm. And she used it for a while and really liked it because she she does a lot of flower gardening. She finally did replant a vegetable garden. So um, I helped them do that. And now I've got to go down and basically do all her planting for her and stuff like that. But Mm -hmm. she she enjoys she enjoyed that piece of equipment and you can get it on Amazon cheap. But the problem was, is like she used it and then like the next season, it just kind of fell out. You know, and then the tools kind of spread out and everything like it's a really Mm -hmm. good idea on paper, Mm -hmm. but I just don't know if it really worked. And what she found out was, um, you know, that washing station I built, Mm -hmm. um, she basically has a table like that that she can stand up on. And I'm here to tell you, man, if you don't have some kind of table or something in a potting bench or something like that in your space, you are missing out on the fruit of life because it is amazing to have a platform to set down and just build something, set stuff, use something, Mm -hmm. pot, whatever it is. That makes a big, big difference in a garden space and it makes you way more productive. So I did, I built this little, um, well, it's not little, but it's a uh, washing station where it's got like a washing bin. I put a makeshift faucet on it, a drying rack, and then a little section to pot. And I absolutely love it. I put it on, it's on YouTube. You can find it um, on the DIY playlist. Um, and I just kind of, I didn't build it on there, but I walked through all the plans for it and everything. So hopefully you guys can use that if you want. But it has made the biggest difference in my garden in my space this year and it is the best investment i made and it was like less than a 100 bucks that's one thing that i have not done in my garden that i pay for every time there is a space that i've been thinking about for the last year or so right on the so in between the cage baby and the deck that's a big walking space for me and so this year I have a row of containers because that's how I roll. But I also have next to it one of those like 37 gallon um, um, bins that you store stuff in. And so what am I storing? Dirt. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> and so I can't find the top to it, but that works out because I have a piece of plywood on top of it. And so it's like a bench there. I'm not sitting on it. It's not that stable, but I can put, I have some flower starts there, you know, and it's not as convenient because I do have to bend down a little bit to get to the things, but having even that, which again, it, it there was no like build for that. But what it's done is it's, reminded me of how convenient having something that's more proper there would be for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So just, a, um, go ahead. No, no, I, I want to, I want you to tap me in for the watering bit. Cause I, I forgot to mention that. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you're going to respond to you my, broke up. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you were going to respond to my non sitable little, uh, uh, bin plywood table. Yeah. I mean, that's how it started for me. I had an old, um, table for my back porch that I was using for a while, but I, it, because I'm tall, 
you know, I'm six mm-hmm. foot two, so everything is like I'm kind of hunched over working on it, and I just got to a point where I was like, I can't do this. So when I built this one, it's like a good four to six inches taller, and it just, you know, I can easily stand there and work, and especially in the spring when I'm getting like a lot of leafy vegetables, and they all, you know, how they all have to be washed. Um, mm-hmm. I can do it all outside and not bring it inside and just makes it more productive. And believe it or not, it actually made me want to grow more of it because it yeah, was so more convenient, so much more convenient to work on out there than bringing it all inside, track the dirt inside, this, that, and the other. So it kind of worked out in my favor, multiple more aspects than I had anticipated, but I do want to hear That's about your hoses. Hear. Yeah. So, um, I know this doesn't apply to to everyone but i do a lot of hand watering so we're at, as of this recording um and we're just at the beginning of july i'm still hand watering i've not pulled out the hoses things um in excuse me i'm not pulled out the sprinklers that's probably coming so um i drag for previous years i used to have a hose for the front yard and a hose for the backyard but now i basically had that hose got all ripped up and so i you know hoses are expensive so anyway now i'm just using the one hose and it's more convenient for my little side of the house walkway y'all call them gangways um but anywho i drag the hose back and forth and the thing that i've noticed is um the corners of the way my garden are set up make for easy again dragging of the hose so that round bed that uh, the fire pit bed in the front yard when I come from the side of the house with the hose and I want to go all the way over to the other side of the yard you know near the porch I don't have to worry about my hose getting caught on anything because it's just going to hug the round bed and right like it's going to make sure that I'm not knocking over plants and things you know it's not going to rise so high where I'm you know again now my hose is inside of the bed there's also this bit in the backyard where based on the raised beds and the squareness of them again it creates this thing where um, the hose isn't problematic you know that absolutely wasn't by design but it's one of those things i don't have to keep on bending over untangling the holes how about that you know (laughs) that's super important for me yeah i do a little bit of hand watering myself and i have my son come outside and i'm like you stand here and when i tell you i'm gonna say (laughs) unkink and you gotta find the kink and so i'm constantly like unkink 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 and he's like running back and forth it's ridiculous i need to get a kink free hose but like you said hoses are expensive Mm -hmm. but since we're digressing into hose being expensive we need to move on to our question of the day but first i do want to tell you guys about the planter app so the planter app is an app it's available on the google store and apple and it's to help plan your garden make it easier to plan right We want to have an easier garden. So it has companion planting and combative plantings. Everything is in a square foot box, so you can do square foot gardening in it. It's a simple drag and drop interface. It has over 80 plants and thousands of the varieties of those 80 plants in it. All the info for the plants are included in it. When to start the seeds, transplant and harvest. You can create plants and custom varieties. There's growing guard guides with articles in it. You can save gardens. I like to take mine and do each year so I can look at the previous year and adjust so I can do my crop rotations. It's all around a great app. Um, you can check it out. There's a link below and you will get a discount for the planter app. And I highly recommend it this platform loves the planter app ding (laughs) so spotify question of the day this is a good one you ready yes so this one is from our episode of you if you could only grow 10 crops this year and Uh yeah uh uh-oh and i don't know how to say the name so i'm just gonna say c because it starts with a c so C says, have either of you ever tried electroculture in your garden? P.S. I love your podcast. Oh, thanks, C. Have you tried electroculture? I don't, I don't know what electroculture is. Okay. I, I was hoping you would not say that. So electroculture <laughs> is like the trend this year, right? And I actually do have kind of a funny story about it. But it's basically... 
Um, people are running copper wires throughout their garden to create to collect electra, el- electricity from the air to help build their gardens grow faster and stronger. And people are just raging about it. Um, mm-hmm. I went my the guy who's mentoring me with my bees. We were walking through his garden when I went to go get my bees. He's like, have you ever done electroculture? And I was like, no. And he had it set up in his garden. So I was looking at it. And, um, I mean, when I looked at it, his plant that he had planted definitely looked better than the other side of the garden. And when I saw it, I was like, man, I don't do electroculture. I'm not really into that kind of stuff. And, um, he was ranting and raving about it and really happy with it. And I've seen a lot of people talk about it. My thing about electroculture, um, is without a prop and there has been studies on it where like a proper study where they didn't really see any extra growth and the growth actually came in lower for the stuff on the electroculture than other um, variables within the study and so i don't i don't want to set it up as my thing mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. and the other thing t- there's an expense there as with ev- anything mm-hmm. but yeah and I mean, when you read it, when you hear the word electroculture, you think you've got it hooked up to your house electricity and stuff like that. That's not the case. But I still I don't want to put the effort into that because I'm comfortable mm-hmm. with the way I'm growing and what I'm doing. So I do mm-hmm. not do electroculture and I do not plan to do any electroculture ever. So that's kind of my stance on it. Um, are you reading about electroculture right now? I'm just poking around to see what it looks like. Um, the biggest thing that came away with a quick Google search is, you know, basically the expense of get. you know, it's oftentimes copper is used yeah. and it's expensive. Um, I would, I, I'm not going to, to do any more reading once we wrap up here on this. <laughs> um, and, you know, just, you know, let's just be, you can't, you can't look into everything. Um, but I would be curious around, um, if it's healthier plants, if it's providing some type of protection for plants, is it, um, you know, producing, improving production? Yeah. I mean, it producing faster, producing more. And for those latter two, I wonder, you know, again, how much are we just saying now, 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 which is not what the garden does. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to be anti it because I don't know enough about it, you know, Good luck to those that are interested in it, that are doing it. Um, I got my hands full right now. Yeah, I'm not anti it either. I just, you know, I've seen videos and stuff like that of people doing it. And they're like, look, I did it on this plant and this plant's better than this plant next to it. I'm like, well, you're not, it's not really how it goes. You know, if you really want to see the difference, you've got to, you got to have a big space with a lot of different variables and constants involved in it in mm-hmm. order to come up with the correct hypothesis of what this is doing. And I just don't see, I'm like you, the expense just isn't for me. Um, he actually had it one step further and they had some crystal in the wire and I looked up and I said, are you into the crystals? And he's like, no, my son is. And he made me do it. He's like, I don't really care about it, but you know, it's just like one extra step and it may very well work and it may not be um, mm-hmm. that. I'm not going to say we would never talk about it on this episode, on this show. We may do a little bit of research and talk about it at some point, but it's one of those, you know, fads for the year. I feel like it's just everywhere mm-hmm. I look, I'm hearing electric culture. I've had a lot of people ask me about it and I've had a lot of people ask me why I'm not doing it. And hmm. the answer okay. is because I don't feel like it. Because it's my garden and I don't want to do it. So there's my answer. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, it's my garden. So, um, yeah, I was actually thinking about it like full on all of the like all kinds of structures, you know, would be, you know, this copper would be all over the place. And just looking at a couple of quick pictures, it doesn't look like Mm -mm. it's it's that many. No. And so then I also wonder, like, um, you know, how effective it is kind of based on the scale. So again, my wondering will stop once we wrap up here. Batavia's going to be at the next vacant house, pulling all the copper wires out of the walls. <laughs> like I'm going to do this. I got it. And we did. Not unless that, not unless that becomes legal. Um, you know, unless Leonard insists that we, we bring this topic back. Um, I'm not going to look into it further, but I really appreciate the question yeah. 
because there are and I'm sure this isn't year one if this has been introduced there are a lot of different things as far as methods some trends that come up in the gardening world and you know you gave me the opportunity to hear the question in advance I probably should have taken you up on it um, but I think it's interesting to know that that's a thing that's out there that people are doing it and you know camps are starting to be formed us against them electros against non obviously I'm joking about all of that am I not joking are we no, serious I'm, I'm are we going to get t-shirts I'm, I'm doing a quick google search real quick mm-hmm I think um, I'm still at the point for my garden where I'm definitely doing some new things, but I'm starting to max out about how much change I can introduce, Mm -hmm. like just mentally, Mm -hmm. you know, um, that's so, a fair statement. That's a, that's a very fair statement. So the, the quick search I did said, um, you know, there's a lot of skeptics for it because there's just not a lot of existing research on it. And then what there is done is very inconclusive and it lacks rigorous methodology. So, you know, I, and this is by no means a new idea, but it's really come to fruition this year. And I think the way it came to fruition, if I'm not mistaken, was the need to feed a growing society, you know, the need to make what little bit of space we have more. Produ- and I'm not talking about gardeners. I'm talking about farmers in particular. Yeah. You know, but again, if you're buying copper to put in, it's going to raise the cost of your produce. So you've got that as yeah, well. Yeah. Well, there could be the concept of there's so much copper that's already in it, and you know, kind of the cycle up, recycle, and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, so okay. there's our stance on electroculture. I have no problem with it. I just don't want to do it. But if you'd like to be like C and leave us a question, by all means, you can do it on Spotify. It's a new feature they have. And because we cannot answer you back on there, we have decided to do them on here. But you can also email us or leave us a question or we'll even pick a question out of the Backyard Garden Community Garden Facebook group, which you are more than welcome to be a part of. Yeah, come on aboard. I love the, what do you all think about insert this kind of thing? Yeah. I love those questions. Yeah, I do too. Um, I have, we haven't gotten any about a certain variety of vegetable yet, but I'm sure that's coming. Stop, look, stop trying to lead the audience. No, I'm not leading the audience. <laughs> Somebody asked me the other day about purple Cherokee tomatoes and what I thought about them. Oh, but, yeah. I have opinions on those. Yep, I do too. But we won't talk about that on this episode. What we're going to do is we're going to consider the fact that we just learn to grow and grow for change. See ya. Now you know why people feel like celebrating at harvest time. All over the world, people have feasting and good times when the crops have been gathered in. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out the Backyard Gardens podcast. If you like what we're doing and you want to continue to support the podcast, head over to our Patreon page to sign up. You can also make a one-time donation using PayPal. Both of these links are in the description. With your support, we can continue growing and helping others in their gardens. See ya. If you guys want some Backyard Gardens gear, go to the link below and check out our t-shirts, mugs, pint glasses, and other gear. All purchases go towards helping to support the show, so thank you so much in advance, and we hope you enjoy. We want everybody to have a garden, and we're going to give you a chance to win free seeds every month. Head over to BackyardGardensTV.com and enter your email address to be entered in all of our giveaways. Good luck! We want you to be a part of our gardening community. DM us a picture of your garden at Backyard Gardens TV on Instagram, and we will share it with our listeners.